Welcome to another episode of the Abona Tennis Online Coaching Podcast. This is your coach, J.Y. Obona. You're tuning in for a special guest episode. I said I was going to be doing this a lot more earlier in the year when I had Marcelo Ferreira on. And what an amazing treat to be able to have Jonathan Stokey from Baseline Intelligence on. Because no matter how long you've been doing something, it's incredible how you continue to learn great information from other people. And right now, Stokey is an incredible person to be listening to because not only is he having so much success with his baseline intelligence podcast, listening to so many great experts like Brad Stein, Paul Anacone, Dustin Taylor. He's having psychologists on there. So many different types of coaches. It's amazing. So he's got, he himself is getting to listen to so many other people, but he's also been an incredible player and continues to be an incredible coach. So this guy is a wealth of knowledge. Yeah, all we do is listen to him, interview other people. I wanted to hear him speak. And to be honest, I felt like I spoke a little bit too much. I wish I can get another opportunity to do it again. But I hope you enjoy this episode as much as I did. And if you haven't tuned into his podcast yet, you can research baseline intelligence. And you'll have a great time learning through a lot of great things about tennis. So hope you enjoy it. And stay tuned until the next episode. Thanks. Stokey, good morning. Welcome. Hey, man. Good to be here. Oh, man, I, I'm so excited to do this because it's been really interesting for me. You know, I mean, you're, I mean, I don't know how much, you know, your podcast has blown up. The amount of people that have said, oh, my gosh, like Stokey's podcast, baseline intelligence, this and that. It, people I've never met before. You know, people that they're listening to you. But what, what's so interesting is that, you know, they, they forget. Because they don't talk about you as the coach. You know, they don't talk about you as the, the, the former, you know, great player you were. They just talk about your podcast. And I was like, man, did this guy, did they need to hear this guy? Because not only does he have amazing experience, juniors, college, you know, you played at the U.S. Open. But at the same time, you've been interviewing these people. Uh, and getting so much great information to implement in your own process and just try to figure that stuff out. So that's why I was so excited. I'm like, man, they, they got to listen to this guy talk. You know, he's always asking questions, but he needs his, he needs a voice right now. Um, so I, I couldn't wait to hear you. You know, you, you've had so many great people on your podcast, Brad Stein, Paul Anacone. I was listening to, to DT's. I mean, DT's mind is just, I mean, there's just so much information there. It's awesome to listen to him. But how would you say like this podcast that you've done, like what are some of the most important things you've taken away listening to other people? Because I found it myself, it's amazing how, you know, we have a lot of experience. We, we've been in this game for a long time, but yet every now and then you hear something, you're like, oh, wow. Or it's said in a way that you're like, geez, yeah, that's so much better. Uh, I need to try mm -hmm. that. So I mean, what are some things that really stood out for you that and have helped you in your coaching world? It, it's honestly such a difficult question because I've recorded 60 episodes. I think I've published 55. And like you said, every episode I pretty much leave and I'm like, like you said, oh, they said this differently than I've said it. Okay, I like, I didn't learn a concept, but I like the way they communicated that better. Or sometimes I leave <clears throat> and I'm so stunned how simple it was. I'm like, man, they, I took something and made it so complicated. And they were like, oh, no, no, just hit cross court. You know, someone yeah. who's won a grand slam, I, I just hit cross court when I'm nervous. You're like, oh, wow, it can be that simple. Or even the opposite, something I thought was simple. Maybe a coach told me eight things they're thinking about it. And I was like, wow, there's different layers to this that I thought wasn't that deep. Um, so there's tons of good things. A lot of times I ask and I'm looking for like the secret drill or the secret thought. And most of these coaches and players, it just comes back to mindset. Like, I'm always like, oh, I want to hear this like trick on your forehand or this trick for how you play the, and they're like, ah, oh, it just comes down to like how I compete, how my energy is, how I am as a competitor. Uh, Louis Kaye is actually going to be my episode. I don't know when you release this, but um, on January 29th, he's coming out and he's a phenomenal coach. And we spent 30 minutes just talking about being a performer. What that means, how, how you're at your best on the court had nothing to do with doubles, positioning. It was, what is your energy? What is your mindset? How do you get confident? 
how can I get you to stay in the present? That's how he makes world number one doubles players. And so that's the one that sticks in my mind because it's most recent. But this genius who has put so many people in the top 100 in the world in doubles and has three world number ones, he basically was just talking about how do I get my player confident and believing and feeling like whatever problem comes at them, they can solve. And I'm like, man, that's what you do. It's not about the volley technique. And he's like, nope, that's what I do. I transform people. He's like, they've all got good volleys and we can do that anyway. It's technical. It's easy. So there's so many great things. And that's why I love the podcast. These people would never pick up the phone if I just said, hey, can I get an hour of your time to just pick your brain? Like Louis Kaye has got things to do. Lindsay Davenport has things to do. Paul Anacone has things to do. But if I throw it on a Riverside app and put a little camera on, they're like, yeah, no problem. You know, so it's like incredible for me as a coach to get to use those resources. That's why it, it, I think that part has been a little bit frustrating to me. And I've just kind of learned to accept it. Um, and, and it's also helped me get away from, I used to be overly technical when I first started coaching. And I've just kind of realized, like, especially in speaking with other coaches, there's very few things we just really disagree on when it comes to technique, right? You, you can go to any coach, even just a random guy you've never met before that just learned how to play high school tennis, been coaching for like 20 years. He's going to say some pretty fundamental things. You're like, yeah, I mean, all right, maybe you'll add a little flavor to this or that. But for the most part, you can kind of find technique everywhere. But what you, what you can find everywhere is somebody who can – unlock the power of confidence believing simplifying the game and just allowing them to just perform and yeah. and that's where it's it's crazy that if it can be that if there's a simple thought it's probably that but how hard is it to execute that right well also to me it's like it's like eating your vegetables it's like okay someone comes to you and they go hey i want to get better at tennis like, cool, we, you analyze their game, whatever, and you watch them play a match. You're like, okay, we need to work on your mindset. I'm like, I, I mean, I get that, but I want to, my forehand doesn't feel good. They want to work on their forehand. Yeah. And to me, the vegetables are like the mindset. Like people acknowledge it's important, but they'd rather get on court with you and be like, JY, can you fix my forehand? I'd be happier if my forehand felt better. And you're like, okay, that's true. It could get better, but you might win more matches if your mindset was better. Like, is that, the, is that the goal to compete and win more or is the goal for your forehand to feel good? Those are two separate things, but I have found most players will listen to mindset and listen to the, the mental side of the game and they'll acknowledge it's important. And then most of them have very little interest in pursuing that long-term as a path to growth. Because they just, want that secret sauce. They want they the want secret sauce and, it, and it's not fun. It's fun to hit yeah. balls. It's fun to hit a ball clean. It's not fun to sit there and be like, what is my ideal energy? And, and what are the rules that I created for myself that give me confidence that I'm breaking all the time? You know, like that's not a fun conversation to have. And you're not on the court. You're not being active. You can't see the progress necessarily the way you can see that a forehand went faster. It's, it's ob almost objectively not as fun. And so they're like, yeah, that could get me better. But, uh, you know, it just it, a lot of times they don't pursue that. Well, yeah, and it, the the tough part, I've found myself saying this in a way, it, it, it sounds mean when I say it to kids, when I'm like, stop trying to feel good. I don't care how you feel. You actually, if you feel bad, it doesn't matter. If you feel good, it doesn't matter. You can be too happy. You can be too angry. Just really embrace the grind, right? Just just fight your way through it. And And I think, like you said, like that – whoever can embrace that first is going to be the, the, the one who improves the fastest, even if they have like the best coaching advice in the world, because when you do start to miss, we all miss at some point and we all get a certain voice in our head. We get a feeling inside. It starts with a feeling We're like, Ooh, that's just bad. If you miss a second one in a row, now you start overthinking. Right. Mm -hmm. And then everything just goes terrible. But mm -hmm. handling that feeling of just, dude, just don't worry. Just keep going. Keep going. It's that is so much harder than just simply focusing on that one thing, that one fix, because you're overcoming this tough, frustrating feeling. And like you said, it's not fun. Right. We were talking, we might talk on this further in the episode, but yeah, you said like, you're going to miss or it's not going to feel good. In my opinion, you miss like 99% of the time. 
Like if you and I go hit and we put a cone down, we don't hit the cone every 10th time. So we're missing it a foot right, a foot short, seven feet long, depends how good you are, but we're never, you're never hitting the ball exactly where you wanted. And so there is going to be some level of feeling of like, ooh, caught it a yard late. Oh, wow, caught it 10 feet late. Oh, wow, it doesn't feel like the center string. To me, you're always there. So you better get comfortable not feeling good because you don't just pure cones from the exact center of the sweet spot every time. Nobody does that. And so if that's what you're hoping for, of course, you're not going to be confident. Of course, you're going to get frustrated. And of course, you're going to feel bad. But at the end of the day, when they see a score online, if I see you beat someone in Atlanta, 6'4", six, 6'4", four, six, four, it doesn't have a little note at the bottom. It's like, by the way, JY felt okay today. So that's why it was 6'4". And the other guy didn't feel good. It's the score is just the score. No one cares. You know? Yeah. And, and, and the way you win, this is, a, this is what I feel like a problem with juniors is like, if they don't feel like they won in a great way, they're like, well, if I'm not playing great, how can I win my next match? It's like, forget that. It's a totally different match, right? right. Maybe you match up better with that player. Maybe this was your bad match, but you found a way through and now you're going to play better. Don't overthink it. But they actually kind of start to think about that stuff in the middle of matches sometimes. They, I'm yeah. playing so bad but it's three, three. What if you play even 1% better? But mm -hmm. they, they don't, they can't think past how they feel, right? right. They don't feel like a great player. Therefore mm -hmm. they can't play well enough to win. It's like, no, yeah. that's not it. It's there, there's a difference in, in Paul, in Paul Anacon on your podcast said incredibly well. It's right. There's a difference between hitting and competing, mm -hmm. right? There's great hitters, but that's not competing. Competing, you have a guy or a girl, right? They're trying to actually ruin your day. They're trying to make you miserable, right? They're trying to put you in uncomfortable situations. If you're feeling too good, they're probably not good enough to push you, right? Mm -hmm. So the, don't overthink that. So it's if you can just get through the person in front of you, get through the, the, the moment that you're dealing with right now, and just if you just do that, you'll be, you'll probably be fine. It's, it's you... the difference. It's, it's the difference between hitting well and playing well. Yeah. Like you can walk off the court. Okay. You hit it. Okay. I played great. I was so smart. I was within myself. I played great. Ball felt okay. Most people will walk off and if the ball felt good, they think they played well. And it's like, not necessarily. Sometimes they go together, but not necessarily. How, do you think that has anything to do with, you know, most people, a lot of their tennis that they see is on TV. And most of the matches that you watch are the best players in the world. So you see, usually those guys and girls are so good that when they play well, they, they're dominating. You see unforced error count very low, winner forced error count pretty high. So then they think, well, that's okay, that's tennis. That's how I got to play. I got to hit 30 winners a match and I got to have 12 unforced error. And mm -hmm. it's like, no, that that's at the highest levels of the entire world to beat the best players of the entire world. But what they don't show you is the number 60 guy or girl playing the number 70 guy or girl. Mm -hmm. It's different. Sure. When you watch Sabalenka play a set and a half and hit 80 on 80 winners, just like on fire, but that that's not most players tennis and that's not junior tennis and that's not adult tennis. Don't try to right. play like that. It's, it's yeah. you're at a different place. Don't. And I, I've always wondered, like, how much is that they watch that and then they, they want to play like that? And it's like... so when, Yeah, so I Zoom with a guy from Atlanta. I've been doing it for a couple months. And this is one thing we talked about because I'll be like, go watch. You're watching the Australian Open. Tell me how many times Medvedev hits a ground stroke on the service line for me, please. It's a lot more than you think. You think yeah. he's aiming on the service line against Verev this morning? There's no chance that's where he wanted to hit. But guess what? That's what happened. Like, he's not perfect. And by the way, he's in the final of a Grand Slam. He's an incredible player. Uh, did he try to play a bad first set and get down two sets to love? Nope. Happens to everybody, you know? And yeah. I think when you watch those guys, yes, there are some highlights. And when a guy is, like, on fire or a girl is on fire at the top of their game, there can be some very impressive stretches. But I'd be like, why don't you watch Medvedev play 50 matches and look for the bad stuff? And you'll be like, he, he plays a lot of bad points. He plays more good points, obviously, but 
there's a lot of bad tennis, but I think people just remember the highlights yeah. and the quick return errors or the the one down the line miss at 40, 15. Oh, okay. Like they don't think about that, but they struggle too. Like it's still pound for pound, but I think the amateur, like you said, they're comparing themselves to a pro, which is absurd anyway, but they're only focused on the pros good. And they're usually mainly focused on their own bad or struggles, you know? Yeah. And so it's like, man, that, that gap looks even bigger now when you look at it that way. Well, and, and you, you bring up this very evident match from this morning. So anyone listening can imagine when we're recording this, but you know, he, uh, down two sets to one, and I think it was four four in the tie break. Hits a double fault, and then Zverev plays a tight point, and Medvedev just comes back and it's a good four. Um, I think he plays a great point with a forehand, basically a forced air down the line, and then hits an ace when he gets his own set point at six five yep. serving. So even though he has what some people would say it was a, maybe a complete choke. You know, probably tight, but he's, mm -hmm. he swung, right? So I, I, I think choking and just swinging out when you're getting tight are two totally different things. But So he swung out, missed a double fault, but it's he overcame what was probably one of the worst feelings in the entire world, right? right. I'm sure he's pretty upset. I'm sure he feels terrible. I'm sure he feels like he's about to blow this match right there on an awful serve. And he found a way to put that feeling aside, getting back to what you said. Put the feeling aside. Just get back to work. Mm -hmm. And he'd come back and then just little by little working his way through. And then you see Zverev, you can see his demeanor, just the, the stress of the match, the missed moments. He's struggling to overcome those emotions, you know? And so you saw it. Was, that's why I love best of five matches. You see so much more of the emotional ride, especially if they get to five sets. And you can see when it starts to pile on one player a little bit too much. They might be calm. Zverev, I didn't see him break a racket, but you could just see he was giving into his feelings a little bit too much. And who did, uh, who, who did Medvedev beat last year uh, in the U S open? Did Medvedev get to the finals? Oh, he beat Alcaraz in the semis, right? Yeah. Alcaraz in the semis. Okay. So in that match, I was trying to remember who the opponent was in that match. He's got a look in his eye. So some of my friends who don't really follow tennis were watching it. Cause it was a great match. And they're like, who do you think is going to win? And I think Alcaraz was up. And I was like, oh, Medvedev for sure. I was like, look, look at look at the look at the look on his face. He's just like right here. Yeah. He's just playing points, you know? And Alcaraz is up here. And I saw the same look from Medvedev today. Like he hits this winner, he double faults in the breaker. Nothing. He's just like, okay, cool. Four or five. Let's go play a point. And then yeah. he wins that point and he looks like, okay, he was in the present. And Zverev looked like he was in the past. I, I can't believe I was up two sets. I can't oh, I can't believe I had five four. Just not in the present moment. And Medi is just like right there. I love Medvedev. I, I, I love watching him. He's entertaining. But when he gets in that mode, like I'd put money down on him any match. It just unwavering. Just yep. nothing. It, 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 things can affect him, but they don't affect him for too long. It's amazing how he can relock himself in. And that's what makes him so good. You know, and I think he and this match is just such a great example of you know, I think too many people in junior get caught up with like, oh, I played a bad set and then things just really fall away. He'll play his bad set. I think early in the tournament, he got to, he lost, went to five sets. I think hey. first match of the of the tournament, lost the first set. I mean, he's not playing the best tennis he's ever played. He's finding a way through. Yeah, he's been down two sets twice. Yeah, yeah. So just to kind of switch gears a little bit, it, it, not entirely though, but Talk, and talking about how to handle these emotions, right? How to handle being mentally tough, the adversity. You know, I, I've been talking to kids and I've been using this saying, I wonder if a little bit too much, I think you're the perfect guy that might be able to put some perspective on this because, you know, my biggest battle with juniors is like when things are going wrong, I want you to actually compete harder, focus more, raise your focus, raise your energy, raise your level go all in even if you think you're all in go even more and it has to be like emotionally mentally everything inside you you know if, if you're not like a, an athlete that's competed for massive things sometimes you might not know what it is what that feeling is but when you've competed at a high level there's a feeling you have inside you when you're just you're all in and you mm -hmm. feel it right you walk faster you move faster you talk to yourself faster maybe even louder you start pumping your, your fist stronger and be more vocal. 
And what I've tried to explain to them is like, look, at that point, like that's where we say you're on the edge, right? You're that mm -hmm. focused, you're on the edge. And on, but on the edge, when you're that emotionally all in, you might get a little frustrated. But I'm like, I'm okay with that. I don't want the player who's too calm, too perfect, uh, too nice, really, and for the most part, winning sportsmanship awards, right? I'm like, mm -hmm. I've always felt if you're winning sportsmanship awards and you're being too nice and, oh, nice shot and everything, something about you isn't all in on trying to find a way to get the job done that day. And mm -hmm. now, look, it's not like winning is everything, right? We, but in the moment, you can't think losing is an option. Mm -hmm. After it's done, it's done. It's fine. But when you tell yourself that, that there's no other option, that's when you can try to raise, you're going to raise your level, right? Mm -hmm. But here's the interesting part, right? You, with your just experience and your success and the sportsmanship side of things. I mean, you were Arthur Ashe Sportsmanship Award winner, uh, the national one and the USTA one in college. You know, that's, I think the Arthur Ashe one, they only give it out to three kids that year. Is that, is that right? In college, uh, the national one? Yeah. The they, just give it to, one. they give it out to one every year. To one. I mean, yeah. so you were the one person that got it, but you were also top 20 in the country in singles, top 15 or even 10 and doubles. So you're an amazing competitor, successful, but also are able to kind of find a balance between like, hey, I can also do this in a way that's respectful and calm, which I find so impressive. And I want to know, am I, am I saying it to these kids wrong? I mean, what do you think? Okay, so I, I just wrote a couple things down so I don't forget them. Okay, yeah. a couple, couple, couple topics. So number one, like if I look back at myself, I could have done things better. Obviously, I'm sure you look back at yourself as a player. So I was a great competitor. I could have been better. Like, I, we don't need to go down the entire rabbit hole, but it wasn't like I was the perfect competitor. Uh, the second thing is there is a personal, your personality, how you are. I am wired to be very calm. Very calm. Like, basically, at practice every day now, every 100 days, I might get frustrated with the kids if they're doing something and like, I go, Hey, it's that hundredth day today. It got me guys. I'm a little frustrated. <laughs> the other 99, anything that happens, a little disrespectful comment, something, I just brush it off. It's no big deal. And I'm wired that way. Some people are wired to be rough at top. They win a point massive fist pump. That was never comfortable to me. Now, if I could go back in time and coach myself, I would make myself do a little more of that. Cause I think it will help. Uh, one time I remember actually against Florida state, at a regional, I was in the semifinals and I hit this absolutely absurd half volley at like five, four in the third. And I shook my racket like that. And my coach was like, oh my God, like that's basically a running 360 fist pump for you by my standard, right? And so you can tell I'm into it. I'm all in on that. But that's how I show it, right? Very little, no screaming, no whatever. Um, so I think it's okay if you're someone who runs hot, like you said, I think it's okay if they get frustrated. That's fine. I also think it's okay if you're like me and you're wired not to be like one time, <laughs> this is actually pretty harsh when I think about it, but one of my assistant coaches, he put uh, quotes up in the locker room to like challenge slash motivate everyone on the team. And the one he sent, he put for me was show me a good loser and I'll show you a loser. Yeah. I was like, okay. I was like, so you think I'm a loser because I didn't crack my racket because I lost to Kevin Anderson, seven, six in the third. Does that mean I didn't try hard because I can put it in perspective relatively quickly? Was I fully engaged in the match? Like I didn't necessarily agree with it, but I understand the concept. And it's kind of like what you're talking about is like, are you all in? And I think you can be both ways. Um, so that was actually a very interesting, <laughs> an interesting quote on my locker, but I totally get the point. Um, the other thing that I think helped me is I'm, huge as a coach and as a player on expectation management. So I, it, if I expect to play well every match, do you think I'll be frustrated? Of course. Yeah. If I expect to hold serve every time you think I'll be frustrated? Of course. I hold serve probably as a player 80% of the time. So I'm serving for the match five, four in the third against UNC and a decider. What are the odds I hold right there? 
They're not above 80. Yeah. In fact, I mean, depending on the situation, maybe I'm nervous, maybe it's below. And so if I lose my serve, I don't go, oh my God, what the hell? I'm so pissed. I'm in the present. I'm playing each point like I can. And if for some reason I don't hold, number one, it's five all. I'm still alive. No problem. And I wasn't expected to hold every single time. So kind of you said like losing isn't an option, which I agree, but I'm more in the present. But if I fail, I also understand rationally that is part of the process of playing. That's why it's fun to play. Does that make sense at all? Yeah. And, and then it just becomes about what do you do with what just happened? What's your reaction right. to that? Right. Right. Do, do you, did that loss just completely destroy your confidence? Cause you just in a way blew for a match, blew a match serving for it. Or are you like, look, yeah, I would, I don't want that to happen. What did I do wrong? What do I got to do better? Okay. I'll try to do that better next time. Yeah. That's I just okay. look at, yeah, I just, I mean, Michael Jordan missed game winners. Alcaraz just lost in the quarters. Like, I, I think Jonathan Stokey as a coach or a player is above that. Like, that's absolutely clinically insane to me. So it's like, I'm not expecting to lose. I'm going out putting everything in the moment. And if I lose a really tough match, guess what? That's part of playing tennis. And I can yeah. be upset about it for a day, but I go, that's that's part of, that's why I enjoy winning too. Okay. Yeah. And then you go out and you win a great match. That's also part of tennis. And then a lot of tennis is just monotonous, not necessarily exciting one way or the other. And you got to learn how to head in the lap. But the game is the game. It doesn't change. Everybody takes bad losses. Everybody has blown big leads. Everybody has come back from big deficits. Everyone has played well. Everyone has played poorly. And that's part of it. And if you somehow think you can practice your way or think your way out of those struggles, you're always going to be frustrated, right? Like you, you can never conquer that. So of course you would be pissed. Um, and the last thing too, I, I talk to my kids about this a lot. So we do a game sometimes, uh, the bowling alley at night. It's like if a drill ends and we have an extra five minutes before it's time to pick up balls, not enough time to do a new drill. They line up on the doubles line and they've got a bowl of ball and try to get it to stop in the far doubles alley. Okay. And if they bowl it and it stops in there, they don't have to pick up balls. And I tell them they got to do the full leg kick like they're doing an actual bowling motion and they have to clap for everybody after. The energy and the focus is off the charts. They're loving it. They're fully engaged. And if someone bowls one and it goes 20 feet too long, they laugh. Okay. Were they not into the game? Did they do that on purpose? I, I, I think they were really trying their best to get it in there but they reacted to failure with laughter ha 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 so fun and then when they did get it in the alley they're pumped up i'm like you know you're allowed to play tennis that way you were actually almost looked more engaged in your bowling that tennis ball into the doubles alley than you did in the ground show game before and you got more mad in the ground show game too so i like it when people compete the same way they do in things that like don't matter as much because it's pure joy. They're in the moment. They're trying their ass off. But then if they fail, they're like, okay. But that didn't impact how they competed in the game. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, two, two thoughts stand out to me. There's one. Um, yeah, I've been saying this to, to boys that play video games. Uh, just because I don't work with any girls that play video games. So I use this with boys, you know, because I used to play video games too. And it's funny that the energy I play video games with, I would almost get more mad than in tennis matches i'd throw controllers i mean and i'd be screaming and yelling in the house of excitement when things went well and then they're, they're the, the same players i see them on the court and i'm like can i get some of your playstation attitude please like i need that fire okay i know it's in you somewhere but how can we view this same tennis in that same fun manner that engages you uh sometimes i think kids are so focused on the result of it but I think with video games, they're created in a way where you're so engaged in every little detail in the moment because they're happening too fast, right? The video games happen fast. You can't like, you can't, there's no start and stop. It, they very fast, games are quick. So you're so locked in to every detail right away. If you lose focus in video games, you're going to lose the game entirely because it's done too quick, right? Mm -hmm. So that's... Yeah, if I can bring that same focus on the present and locked in just, okay, yes. Uh, like, you know, if you're 
playing FIFA, they score a goal on you, but the, the, the time moves fast, right? It's not a full 90 minutes. It's actually like six. So it's mm-hmm. like, all right, they scored. G- Got to get back. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Oh, they scored. Well, get back. Get back. Get back. Everything's happening so fast. They're so engaged. It's like, can I get some of that mentality out here? The, the other part that stands out is, especially you with smiling and the competing, I think of Alcaraz. But I'm going to tie that into something else you said, like, hey, this is who I am. This is how I compete. But this is the best way I do it, right? Like you said, you're a calm person, right? Alcaraz, probably more than anybody at that level, smiles. And we probably see him enjoying the moment more than anybody. I think too many people will then say, you need to be more like Alcaraz. Wait. Okay. You need to be you first. Now, can we try to implement a little bit of what Alcaraz does, you know, or do, can we implement a little bit more of the calmness that Federer or Stokey have? Or do we need that big energy that Nadal has? Or Djokovic thrives when he's angry. Try it a little bit. But if it doesn't work, don't force it, right? You got to see what works for you. Um, mm-hmm. We all, okay, what can we learn? What can we add? Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But I think trying to get a child to be like Federer when they have too much of they, – they play with too much energy. They have too much passion. They're, they're vocal. That's who they are. You're actually going to destroy that kid because they're, be, they're not going to be themselves. Um, I think Paul Anacone said that on his podcast. Just play to your identity. If you're a certain volley, you're a certain volley. If you're a baseline, don't try to be somebody you're not. I think sometimes parents that aren't involved in coaching will watch these superstars. And be oh, why can't my child be as calm as you know Nadal on big points? You know why can't? Maybe that's not who they are. Okay, yeah, we don't want them throwing the rackets either every point, but let's try to mold them within what works for them. And if they're a little bit more vocal that and they scream frustration sometimes, let's just make sure it's done in a healthy way and they respond well after. What well, that's what really stood out to me is like you have to stick to your identity and some people yeah. they can do well when the, and win a sportsmanship award, but they're not trying to win the sportsmanship award. They're actually, that's just who they are. And that's actually when they compete their best when traveling with Riley, when he played his best, he was actually uber calm, crazy calm. It was unbelievable. He would almost, he'd actually walk so slow that he would get time violations, but that's when he played his best. If he tried to walk fast like Djokovic or anything like that or Nadal sometimes, what I, I could tell it just wasn't going to work for him. Mm-hmm. You know, so you got to be who you are and then get better within who you are. I was going to say, I think there's this sweet spot of caring enough to put the effort and the energy into it, but also simultaneously, like, kind of not caring about the result. Like, I want to win. I'm glad that I won those Kalamazoo's and got to play the U.S. Open. Do those things do anything for my life now? Not really. No one at my academy even knows I played in the U.S. Open. Like you said, people listening to podcasts maybe don't even know that I played like competitively. Who knows? For that week after I won Kalamazoo, oh my God, it's so great. Guess what? I had a tournament the next week. Yeah. Now what? If that tournament stunk, now what? Okay, now I'm upset for a couple of days. But guess what? There was a tournament two weeks later. It's always on to the next thing. So that win, while it did feel great or that loss hurt, there's always something new. And at the end of the day, I personally want to enjoy the journey more. So if my match was hell, I was two hours of nerves. I didn't play the way I wanted, but somehow I won. Am I happy? Was that a great way for me to spend two hours of my life? And by the way, how long does that happiness from the win last me? An hour? And then I've got another match that I got to get nervous about. You know, so what's, yeah. what's the point of that? I like watching Alcaraz. I can tell he likes playing that match. That was four somewhat enjoyable hours for him. And he really wants to win. And that loss probably hurt him a touch. And then he's on to the next, hey, now I'm in the moment of my practice. And I like practicing and growing and getting better. I just feel like you have to, you really have to enjoy the process and the journey, whether that's in the match or the practice. And when you do that, it frees you up because you're already experiencing almost that high of winning because you're just loving what you're doing. Yeah. And that'll, that frees you up and then you actually will win a little bit more, which by the way, still is enjoyable, but you can also put that in perspective because Alcaraz won, you know, Wimbledon 
Okay, but everyone's just talking now about, oh, you can't get past the quarters. Well, how long did that Wimbledon win, you know, satisfy him? It's over. He has this awesome memory now. It's great. He's, I'm sure he's thrilled about it. You think he wakes up every day going, I can't believe I won Wimbledon holding the trophy. He's going, how do I, how am I going to win the French? It's over. He'll look back at it someday with his grandkids, whatever, but enjoy the journey, stay in the moment. It's when you play your best. You know, I'm, I'm curious about your U.S. Open experience because I, I was lucky enough to get a wild card in 2008 and into the qualifying for singles. And my first two days there and my first round were hell. I was so nervous. I felt so out of place. I was a wild card. I didn't feel like I earned it. It's not like now where sometimes you earn your wild card by winning challengers and stuff. Um, I won a, a future and stuff, but I felt out of place. No joke, being at the US Open in the locker room with these guys. In my first match, I was so nervous. When I landed, I cramped. First point. I mean, who cramps first point of a match? Luckily, I got what was arguably the best draw. So the guy was like retiring, whatever. So I. I found a way through, but it was a, I was miserable. Arthur Ashe behind me, I was shaking the whole match. I, I can't remember a point. I was so nervous. But after I won, then it was almost like, okay, I kind of deserve a little bit to be here. And then I actually enjoyed the second match. Then I actually felt like I competed. I, I took it all in. I was like, okay. But that first round match, those first two days, I was – I couldn't enjoy it. I couldn't. It was just too new. It was a lot for me. I felt like I got lucky to get through it. But then the second one, I enjoyed. Mm -hmm. So I wonder what your experience was like going in there. I would say I would say similar. The first year we played, we didn't play till Wednesday. So I think we practiced Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday there. And I was loving it. Like my locker was next to Sampras. Like funny story, him about kind of like him dissing me there, but... But like, I'm just enjoying it incredibly. I'm like, man, I actually feel pretty good. And then we were fourth or fifth up, something like that on the old court four, which was like a, you know, they had Ash, Louis, Grand Sand, and then court four had like side bleachers. It's kind of where court four, five, six are now, but there was only one court. And Enquist was like in a fifth set before us. And like, it was like four, three. And I was like, oh, we're getting pretty close. And it hit me like a ton of bricks. And I was like, oh my God. I'm super freaking tight now. Like I wasn't nervous at all until that moment. And then I served the first game. I served 11 out of 12 first serves. Bombs got broken. And then, <laughs> and then, and then totally fine from then yeah. on. I was like, okay, like that happened. They returned well, but I played okay. We're in. If that, is that the worst that can happen? I got broken. I'm still alive. Okay. Now, now I can enjoy it. And then the second time I would say the next year we played, I was much more relaxed and we just got beat again. I mean, we're playing good players and we're juniors, but yeah, that first time I was fine until about 20 minutes before. And then it was like absolute panic. Yeah. And it's something that you, you just can't prepare for something that's that new. I mean, that's right. I think and that's so much for, for, for juniors uh, and even adults that are just starting to play leagues and stuff. You can prepare all you want until you actually go through something. You have no idea what it's going to be like for you. And what it what it was like for me is going to be different with what it was like for you. I can't prepare the way you did. We're going to each do what's best for us, but we respond differently. We're different people. Um, and that's why it's like, don't freak out about your first experience. Allow yourself to go through every whatever emotions you feel. But like you said at the beginning of this podcast, don't give into it. Don't overthink it. Let it be. Just do your best you can in the present moment that's right in front of you. And don't worry if you feel good or you feel bad. It just is what it is. You're nervous, be nervous. You're angry, be angry. You're calm, be calm. Don't try to be something else and roll with it, learn from it. And the next time you get back out there, um, I never got back to the US Open, so I never got to give it a second chance. Um, but for most people, you're, you're, there's a junior tournament coming up. There's another adult league tournament coming up. You'll get a chance to do better. So don't there's freak out if it doesn't next. go well. Yeah. yeah, there's always something next. Yeah. You know, I wanted to hit on this, uh, this final question because I think what people also forget about you is your time as a collegiate coach, associate head coach at Duke. You were also at Wake Forest. Uh, so many kids, you know, they're, they want to play Division One college tennis. 
right? Which really quick, Division two, Division three, there's still some pretty darn good players. So if you don't get into Division one and tennis is your dream, there's still some really good tennis where you can develop and heck, maybe even transfer out and move up. But they all want to play Division one. Now you recruited players trying to play Division one. And one, I can't imagine how many emails and calls you're getting. Like, oh, can you recruit me? Can you recruit me? I want to play for you. I want to play for you. Um, so it's hard for you to narrow your list down to the ones who you think like, all right, this is who I want on the team. What are some things that these kids should know or parents about the process, what you look for, um, and maybe things they overlook at times and overthink that they should be aware of so that that they can be better prepared for this process? Because it's a stressful right. one for them, trying to get recruited. And, you know, if you're the top kid in the country, it's, it's easy. They're reaching out to you. Right. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to do a lot, but most kids are, they have to sell themselves. They have, yep. to, they got to get your attention. So what do you think? Okay. So loaded question. I'll, I'll run down. I just was making some notes. So I don't forget anything. Cause I can tend to do that. Talk in circles. Um, the first thing in the process I would say is be humble. It's, it's not necessarily about you. Like, so I'll just my experience at Duke. I'm recruiting 10 blue chips every year. That's that's Duke's standard of recruit. You know how many good players I've seen? Like we had a guy who won Zoo. We have the number one Brazilian dude who was top five ITF. I've seen a lot of good players. You're not special. If you act as if it's an honor for me to be speaking with you about coming to Duke, it's kind of, it's a big turnoff right off the bat. I'm like, man, what's four years going to be like once you get comfortable with me? If you're already asking me what, I'm going to give you for the privilege of coaching you. Um, and I know it can sound a little harsh, but there's been plenty of kids who have walked in. It's about Duke tennis. It's about Georgia tech tennis, it's about Florida state tennis. You're going to come be a part of that. I want to sense that humility and that even though you are a great player or you're good enough to be at my school, that you want to be coached and you want to be part of a team. So that was something I always looked for right off the bat. That's just a personal thing that I would look for. Um, the second thing is I like it when I got the sense that they felt like their work is just starting. I liked when a player was like, what do you think I can do to get better? That's a great question. Someone can ask on a recruiting trip. You've seen me play. What do I need to do? Right? Not like I'm trying to get to do, cause that is my goal. And then once I'm there, like, we'll see what happens. Like you don't arrive at Duke, get to Duke. And you're trying to make the first final four in program history. So you got to get better. I want to see that hunger. I would, that's a massive thing. People who feel like they've arrived don't get better. They don't. Um, the third thing I would say is yes, results matter some. Like when we were a top 10 team, we were not recruiting guys who were 100 on tennis recruiting. That's, that's reality. Of the kids we were looking at who were in our range, I, we brought a guy on, I flew on a red eye. We lost four, three to Pepperdine, actually four, three to Cal. The next day we lost four, three to Pepperdine on spring break. I got on a red eye from Malibu to Mobile, Alabama to watch an 8 a.m. match the next day of this kid who wanted to come and he, and he lost O and O. And by the way, that guy came to our school, played five and did great. And the dad looked at me and goes, Oh, guess you won't be recruiting him now. I'm like, why, why do you say that? I flew on a red eye. He's obviously good enough for me to fly over here. I know he had a tough day. Guess what? I've lost not O and O at that stage, but I've lost pretty bad too. I like the way he fought. I like his backhand. I watch him play another match. But you think I'm writing him off because he had a bad day? Like that's absurd. But I do think people think that. Oh my God, I got to win. The Duke coach is watching or what? You know, you have to show me you're a good competitor. You have to show me you have a little bit of potential. I want to see how you compete on the court. I know you're nervous. If you really want to go to Duke, of course you'd be nervous if I'm watching you. I get that. It's okay. I want to see how you handle your nerves. See how you handle yourself. Um, so that's that's a huge thing. I think people think they're living and dying. And I'll even go one step farther. I think I've admitted this once on a podcast. So I don't mind saying it. If I'm at Kalamazoo and I'm recruiting the best kid in the country, okay? Well, let's not even say that. The 10th best kid in the country. So I'm interested in them, other teams that are five to 10, but maybe the top team in the country is like, ah, we're on the fence with them. We might be able to get someone better. 
Does it help me as a recruiter if that kid wins Kalamazoo? I would argue it hurts me. That's selfish, but selfishly that hurts me because now the top team's like, whoa, that kid's actually pretty good. Maybe I should jump in the mix and try to recruit him. Now, I'm not saying I'm that selfish that I would root against the kid, but th there are times if, if all the schools that are 25 in the country are looking at a player and he breaks through and wins Kalamazoo, guess who's now interested? Top 10 teams, right? So if you think the coach is sitting there rooting passionately going, that kid has to win. Oh my God. Or I'm not going to let him come to school. They're not watching with that level of intensity. They're not that concerned with the result as you are, if that makes sense. Yeah. Look, this is an awesome example because I think when kids start to get to probably the age of 16, 17, and for sure 18, but I think more that 16, 17 range, right? They kind of, they, they start to live and die by every result. Thinking that I actually had a kid recently and uh, he texted me about his jump on the college tennis recruiting list after one good tournament. I said, don't ever talk to me about that again. Just <laughs> no, get no back to work. Coach, no college coach knew that. I can promise you that. <laughs> yeah. It's like, just keep getting better. I'm like, yeah. remember, it, fine. But look at why you moved up. Why did you have a good result? It's the way you've been working hard every day, no matter what. You've lost some practice sets. You've had some bad drills. How did you bounce back? That's what's more important. And so I was like, no, it, it's not about the result of it. Yes, to a degree. But a coach will go watch you. They can, t they can tell when there's a player that they want to recruit. Mm -hmm. Win or lose. They, they know what they're looking for. They're looking for the athletic skills, the mental skills, the rebound skills. Okay, you lost 0-0. How do they do the next match? It doesn't stop there. Now, if you lose 0-0 three matches in a row because you're so demoralized, that sends a bigger signal than that one match. So that's really awesome for you to say that because I think too many people get stuck on that result and uh, that, hey, college coaches accept bad days, bad results. They're looking at the entire thing and not the entire – list of your results the whole package your schooling who you are how hard you work what do you want out of coming to this school everything you know you don't kick guys out of your program when they lose a bad match at duke mm -hmm. if, they, if it was all about winning and losing you'd be kicking guys out that were having losing records right but no you keep them there because you think they can continue to grow and contribute to the team and eventually they'll they'll be the person that you thought they could be so i, I should have known that maybe doing a podcast as a hobby was in my future. So like you're at Kalamazoo and we get there at 8 a.m. and then last doubles finishes at say 6 p.m. And you're sitting there with basically whatever coaches are also recruiting that player. And you're just talking all day long. Like that's all you're doing, right? And I would ask questions. I would always just pick people's brain, like see if they could teach me something while we're sitting there watching. And I would ask, what are the three things you want in a player? You could only pick three. It could be anything any aspect of play, you can pick three things. And two of them came up almost every time. The third one was debatable between two things. The first one was amazing mindset. I want an animal. Okay. That's what I want. That's number one, what I want. Number two is I want an athlete. You got to be in shape. You got to be able to move. I want an animal who can be in shape and move. The third thing, which was like, 75-25, uh, 75% 25 people said, I want a good serve. 25 said, I want a big forehand. Okay. So if I know that, I go, you know what I should do when my coach is watching me? I should be athletic, bouncing around and just look like Nadal at the French or whatever my version of that is. I want that guy to look at me and be like, oh my God, I love that kid. Oh, his backhand stinks. Guess what? That's what a coach is for. When he comes to school, I'll fix his backhand. But I love that kid and the way he plays. I found it so interesting because I thought I'd get like a bunch of different things. And it was always like, uh, I, I think I'd want a good competitor and a good athlete. And then the third thing was either forehand or serve. Get so those you, things. you mean that the, the perfect straight arm follow through on the forehand wasn't one of those top three things? Yeah, you know, they, they didn't talk about the backhand slice approach and the first volley and, and his racket tip was up on the take back. No. No, never, never came up. No one cares. Literally no one cares. Yeah. You know, what's funny is when I was still playing, 
uh, I remember being at a future and I was waiting to go on and I look two courts down and I see this kid, tiny, unbelievable competitor. But, and like you said, athletic, running so fast, so hard, even after losing points, getting ready, bouncing. I'm like, oh my God, who is this kid? Right away. Well, what do I do? I call my former Florida State coaches. Hey, do you know this kid? You got to recruit him. Zeke Clark. Mm -hmm. They're like, yeah, he's going to Illinois already. I'm like, darn. And what do you know? That kid has turned out. I, I didn't look at recruiting lists. I didn't look at his blue chips. I didn't look at his ranking, UTR, nothing. I was just watching him play against another person who's a decent player. And I'm like, that's a guy that you're going to want on your team. And sure enough, I mean, I think he's last time I checked that he was like 400 ATP, you know, so because his attitude is just is incredible. I mean, so he's, he's an animal. Yeah. So now it's really awesome stuff. I mean, Stokey, I don't know if you want to add anything to it, but this has been great. I, I really appreciate your time. Any, any other thoughts you want to add in or? No, I mean, look, it's always good to talk tennis. I mean, it's what I'm doing as a hobby anyway, but I mean, it's all important stuff. And I just think we probably didn't, maybe we said something that someone hasn't heard for the first time, but again, like I say, all these coaches, they're saying the same things. And just for me as a rule, like if I go, man, all the experts in the world say the same thing maybe there's something to that. If they were all saying different things, then I can understand picking and choosing what you like. But if they're all going, you know what? Let's have a good mindset. Let's have this type of energy. Let's have this type of competitive spirit. Maybe maybe there is something to that. All right. I love it, man. Tell everyone where they can find you. And, you know, baseline yeah, so tell this podcast if they haven't listened to it. Yeah, I mean, you got to get on there. Yeah, hopefully anyone listening to this, uh, the Baseline Intelligence podcast it's uh pretty much every other monday i put out an episode uh instagram at stokey tennis and then i actually i don't know if i told you that i started youtube like two weeks ago nice. which is actually yeah it's actually super fun because number one i stink at it right off the bat so it's like something you can get better at um but being able to shoot horizontal videos you can get more in there you can show more tactical stuff and then you know learning how to edit and stuff so it's still stokey tennis on youtube um, if they want to subscribe and watch kind of like clips from my lessons or clips from things I'm talking about, but yeah, always just trying to find a new project, something to get better at, something to learn from. I love it. We'll keep it up, man. It's uh, even me. I'm, I'm listening. I'm learning. So, you know, selfishly, please keep it up. So I enjoy it. All right, man. Will do. All right. Have a good one.